Hi guys and welcome back to another video. Today, I will be taking you to late 19th century Yugoslavia, when a certain lady was wreaking havoc in the region, poisoning up to 150 people between the 19th and 20th centuries. So let's have a listen. It was the year 1838, when a wealthy cattleman and his wife welcomed a healthy baby girl they named Anna. The young family would spend the first 10 years of Anna's life in Wallachia, Romania, tending to cattle and living an ordinary, quiet, rural life. Then, in 1849, the family Dracin left their native Romania and moved to the tiny village of Vladimirovac, in what is Serbia today. Vladimirovac is situated northwest of the capital of Belgrade and has a modest population of some 4,000 people. Despite its small population, however, the area was and still is quite diverse. Today, only around half of the townspeople are Serbs, with around 35% Romanians living there and the remainder being mostly of Romani descent. When Anna arrived in Vladimirovac, her wealthy father enrolled her in a private school in the city of Panchevo, some 24 kilometers from her hometown. There, Anna enjoyed a top education alongside other pupils who also came from well-to-do families. And that is pretty much all there is known of Anna's youth, as 19th century records tend to be somewhat limited and incomplete, or some simply disappear entirely. But we do know that Anna spent her younger years living predominantly in her father's house, and led what we can assume was a fairly regular life for a girl in her teens. However, all that would change when Anna turned 20 years old. It was the 1850s and Vladimirovac was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, with many Austrian soldiers stationed in the area. Around this time, Anna met one such Austrian soldier and fell madly in love with him. It didn't take long for the two to begin a passionate affair that would unfortunately for Anna be short-lived. After being seduced by the soldier, Anna contracted syphilis and he broke things off with her, leaving her feeling broken-hearted and ashamed. It was this incident that made Anna become somewhat of a misanthropist. From this moment on, Anna would withdraw from the world and preferring her own company, she found solace in books. More specifically, Anna became very interested in anything medicine, chemistry and herbology. However, her solitude wasn't long-lasting, as her father, being a traditional man, arranged a marriage for her at some point in her late 20s, early 30s. Anna went on to marry a much older man with the surname of Pistov or de Pistonia, who was a landowner, so at the time a decent match. She would go on to have an astounding 11 children, but tragically, only one of them would survive to adulthood. Anna's surviving child would go on to become a prosperous merchant sailor. Anna would stay married to her husband for 20 years, until his death in the late 1880s, early 1890s. And it is after his death that things officially took a turn for her. Following her husband's death, Anna was finally able to live out her dreams and pursue her passion for herbology once more. To this end, she converted one wing of her house to serve as a laboratory in which she could collect herbs and make her own potions that she would then distribute to the local townsfolk. Having spent 20 years honing her craft and studying herbology, by the late 19th century, Anna had earned quite a reputation as an alchemist and healer. And if this isn't ironic, then quite frankly, I don't know what is. In her early career days, Anna was extremely popular with the wives of farmers in the area, who came to her seeking a solution to their husband's various health problems, and Anna was, as you can imagine, all too happy to help. In addition to helping wives and young women, Anna soon expanded her business to helping local men in the area, who would often complain of frequent ailments. A large proportion of her clientele, mostly unassuming women with marriage problems, sought to buy so-called magic water or love potions from Anna's shop. What they didn't know, however, was that those healing potions contained arsenic in small quantities, as well as certain plant toxins that were incredibly difficult to detect. Unsurprisingly, the unsuspecting patients would die around 8 days after drinking Anna's concoction. In order to find the ideal amount of arsenic to add to the mixture, Anna would ask her clients questions such as How bad is the status of your marriage? and What is the body mass index of the patient? She likely asked the former to be able to tell how happy the relationship was and whether she should help save it or the woman trapped in it. 
Young men looking to escape compulsory military service also sought her help, and again she would produce potions that would make them ill enough to escape serving their country. Having honed her craft for so many years, Anna knew just how strong a dose was needed to make her victims fall ill or preferably die. As Anna's clientele consisted mostly of married women and men, her victims were usually young and healthy men, so it was only a matter of time before someone grew suspicious. In the meantime, as sales continued and her popularity only rose, rumors of witchcraft began to spread throughout the village. People reported seeing Anna wear only black dresses with a matching black headscarf and shoes, and when she wasn't concocting her killer potions, she would be seen sitting by the window for the longest time just people watching, which naturally creeped out some neighbors. Soon, Anna became known as the village's black widow and witch, and the people, and later media, nicknamed her Witch of Vladimirovats, the Banned Witch after the region, and Little Mother Anyushka, among other equally creative names. To make matters worse, Anna expanded her goods to include charms and talismans, only spurring the rumors of witchcraft. However, the growing suspicion and rumors didn't stop Anna from following her passion. No, she actually went about poisoning and murdering people for decades, completely undetected by authorities. But everything good must come to an end, and in the early 20th century, as illnesses spread and bodies piled up, people began to accuse Anna of using supernatural powers to make her customers fall ill, and in some cases die a premature death. In June 1915, Anna's first trial would take place in Bela Tsrkva. She stood accused of providing poison to women who were looking to get rid of their lovers. However surprisingly, perhaps with little actual proof, she was acquitted. And this is understandable, if it is simply hearsay or an assumption, I don't see authorities digging up bodies and performing autopsies. Instead of taking this as a sign, however, Anna, ever the scorned lover, went straight back to her poisoning ways. Surprisingly, the trial and publicity did her sales no disservice, and in the 1920s, she hired her own sales assistant called Lyubina Milankov to help procure potential clients. She would do so by eavesdropping in on townsfolk and bringing them to Anna's house. At the height of her success, Anna sold her magic water for around 2,000 and 10,000 Yugoslav dinars, or between 20 and 100 pounds, and made a respectable income for an older single woman at the time. And for another 13 years, everything would run smoothly once again. Then, in January 1924, Anna sold one of her customized magic waters to a certain Stana Momirov for 2,300 dinars. Stana was a regular client of Anna's and would often drop by for herbal medicines for various ailments. This time, she had requested a potion for her husband, Lazar Ludoshki. However, after he drank the potion, instead of feeling better, he fell seriously ill and died only a few days later. Following her husband's passing, Stana got remarried to another man from the same village, and within a few months, a rich uncle of her second husband also died under similar circumstances to her first husband's death. When police questioned Stana, she told them that Anna was responsible for his death, but again without proof, Anna walked free once more. In December 1926, Anna then sold her magic water to Asima Momirov and his wife Sofia, supposedly of the same family as her previous customer. The couple, who was involved in a family quarrel, sought to kill Sima's 70-year-old father, Nikola Momirov. Whether Anna knew of this or not is not known, but a potion was sold for 5,000 dinars after the couple heard about Anna's magic potion shop from a local woman named Danica Stoic. Sofia, the wife, gave the magic water to Nikola's granddaughter, Olga Sturza, who was 16, and ordered her to ensure that he drank all of it. Nikola did as asked fell ill and died after only 15 days. And this time, things wouldn't go so rosy for Anna. In fact, Nikola's death proved to be the nail in the coffin and Anna was arrested yet again on May 15th in 1928, aged 90. The whole Momirov crew, that is Stana, Sofia, Sima, as well as Danica, who recommended her to the family, the granddaughter Olga and even Anna's assistant Lubina were arrested and charged with the murders of Lazar Ludoshki and Nikola Momirov, respectively. This time, authorities exhumed the bodies of all victims and performed subsequent autopsies at the University of Belgrade, proving that one way or another, Anna was implicated. 
The trial kick-started in June 1929 at the district court in Panchavo, and the hearings took place on the 18th and 19th of June. The trial continued on on the 1st of July when results were finally available from chemical testing of samples found in Anna's house, at which time the prosecutor and defense attorneys gave closing statements. The prosecutor saw the death penalty for all defendants except Olga, who was a minor at the time of the murder, and for whom he saw the prison sentence. Married couple Seema and Sofia defended themselves at the trial, claiming that they had no idea the magic water contained poison. According to them, they believe it was just plain water and the death was the result of Anna's dark magic. However, when you think about this, why would you buy plain water, especially for what was then an astronomical sum for a regular village couple? It was far more likely that they actually believed in Anna's powers. The wife, Stana, who killed her husband, claimed that she only wanted the magic to heal her husband as he suffered from substance abuse and that she never meant to actually kill him. During the trial, Anna denied all charges till the very end, claiming that she never sold any magic water and that the whole case against her was fabricated by her assistant, who was looking to put the blame on her. In the meantime, Olga said that she was just a child at the time of the murder and that she wouldn't have willingly killed her grandfather. But Sofia testified that Olga was well aware of the whole plot. Meanwhile, Dr. Brank Wurdelja, who conducted the autopsies, testified that traces of arsenic were found in both bodies. The verdict came on July 6, 1929, when Anna was sentenced to 15 years in prison for her role as accomplice in both murders. Sofia, who poisoned her father, and Stana, who killed her husband, were both given lifelong sentences, while husband Seema was given 15 years and assistant Lubina 8 years behind bars. Both Olga and Danica were acquitted. As a result of the retrial, Sima's sentence was increased from an initial 15 years to life and the assistant sentence went from 8 to 10 years. The other two were again acquitted. Anna was never tried for any other crimes and after only 8 years in prison, aged 98, she was released due to old age. Whether she actually practiced anything after her release was never disclosed. But she died two years later, having turned 100 years old, in her house in Vladimirovac. Now some people have argued that perhaps she really didn't plan on killing her customers. But given her at least 20 years strong expertise in the field, that is unlikely as I'm sure she was more than confident in herbology. Also, she would always inquire about the patient's body mass index, weight, etc. One could also argue that perhaps her assistant was involved and tried to blame it on Anna. But her assistant was there to procure customers and it was unlikely that she actually understood the ins and outs of medicine. There is also the fact that Anna was already accused of poisoning people in 1915, but she hired Lubina in the 1920s. When Anna went to trial, a German newspaper reported that Anna helped women who were looking to get rid of their husbands, poison their husbands on purpose. And given that her early experience with men involved a sexually transmitted disease, public shame and heartbreak, this might just make the most sense. In any case, thank you for listening in today and see you on the next one.